Hello, welcome to Graphic Policy Radio, the podcast where comics and politics meet, recorded during the week that eats like a year. This is your host, Ilana Levin, aka Ilana Brooklyn, and I have two exciting guests joining me today for the show. For the first time, Matt Fraction is joining me. Matt Fraction writes comic books and lives somewhere out in the woods with his wife, writer Kelly Sudaconic, two children, two dogs, a bearded dragon, and a yard full of cows, coyote, and deer. Welcome to the show, Matt. Crows. Crows, not cows. But uh, cows would be great. Hi. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That I was like, that is even more things than I anticipated. Of course, the wild, um, the wild cows of Oregon. And returning champion coming back on the show is Elsa Chartier. She is a comic book artist and writer, self-taught, and after debuting on Cal Image Comics 2014, she co-created the award-winning The Infinite Loop comic book series with, P- with Pierre Collinet. Uh, since then, she has been dividing her time between creating new creator-owned books, Super Freaks, and drawing established characters. Clients include Random House, where she did George R. R. Martin's Windhaven graphic novel, uh, DC Comics with Harley Quinn, Starfire, Marvel's The Unstoppable Wasp, whom we do adore, uh, Lucasfilms, IDW, Disney, and New York Magazine. She is currently working on November with Matt Fraction. Elsa lives in the south of France. Welcome back, Elsa. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me again. This is fabulous. So I haven't really talked to you guys since the... Well, I've never, never talked to Matt, but I've never talked to you, Elsa, either uh, since like COVID really kicked into full world sort of changing gear and i i would just you know we the three of us are living in three very very different places uh you know i'm in new york and a lot of people make a lot of fucked up assumptions about what it's like here now um and you know like yeah there's a generational uprising against the cops across america i hear that it's happening around the world a little bit too uh we have covid but people are like not dying in the street the city is not on fire. You may have people seem to have read a lot of things that are not accurate, um, but it is a rough time. And I, I am curious, like, what are things like where you guys are right now? Um, well, for us, it's uh, so I live in south of France and in a small town. So we got away with it. I want to say the, the bigger, st- scariest part, we weren't really hit by it. So um I guess it wasn't as scary as it would have been if we were still living in Paris because it got it got really hot there for, for a little while. Um, but we got, you know, we we stayed inside and we got a lockdown too. And so that was hard and we haven't been able to travel or see friends or see family for, for a long time now. Yeah. Um, so it has had um, its toll on, on, you know, our mental health. But um, generally speaking, we're okay. <laughs> and you guys are actually were getting you guys were actually getting money from the government uh, like, we, we, in a significant way. Were you guys getting that as a freelancer? Uh, no, um, yeah, but it was it was kind of um, we could have, but with our situation, we did not. Oh. Uh, but we had money on the side for such things. We had an un- anticipated a pandemic, but uh, as a freelancer, it's always you know better if we, if you can have some money on the side for unexpected uh, uh, tragedies. And so we had, so we 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 got through it okay. Oh God, because I just that stinks. Like I every every well, most people in America don't seem to understand this, but I I've certainly read that you know in in France people were actually getting money from the uh, government to offset being able to actually stay at home and quarantine. Whereas yeah, it's not been- um, most companies got um, their employees paid through the government. Basically, the the government paid employees for full two three months. Eighty percent of salaries were. Um, assumed by the government. But so it's it didn't huge. help freelancers. It didn't do it for you guys. Um, well, it, freelancers, it, well, the, how it worked is, is that you, you had to compare it to the same month of the previous year and they would pay whatever you had uh, made, say, in March 2019. And as a freelancer, since our, you know, our money and the money that we make fluctuates a lot, it turns out that in March 2019, we had made zero. 
So oh my god! Yeah, it was bad, <laughs> bad timing. But uh, so they couldn't pay us anything because comparing to last year, no. So France is not utopia. It still is not taking care of all the folks. Got it. I don't. I don't see how that would have been possible to take care of everyone. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. uh, no. But I think that the 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 what what was done was great. You know, it may have not have been enough to support everyone, but it supported a lot of folks, and uh, it was really helpful. Matt, how's things out in the Pacific Northwest? Out, out in the anarchist, <laughs> on the anarchist jurisdiction of Portland, um, it's uh, fine, uh, except for the you know there are nightly. Um, I, I don't even know that protest is the right word anymore. You know, support marches, gatherings, mm-hmm. rallying around the the cause of of, of Black Lives Matter. Um, and then our militarized and federalized police force uh, beat the shit out of a bunch of kids and fire tear gas that they're not supposed to be firing. And it goes, everyone goes home and it continues sort of in very specific, very contained, usually centered in a park, uh, public parks. Um, mm. And uh, uh, the, the, the flimsiest of excuses are used. Uh, oh, you're here now. You're, you're, this is a gathering without a permit is a big popular one. Um, didn't know you needed a permit to be in a public park, but you do. Um, uh, apparently at all times. And yeah, it's, it's gnarly and gross. And, um, uh, but again, it's, it's an incredibly like, it's a couple of blocks, you know? Um, you know, we had a standoff around a federal building downtown. If you did not go around that federal building, you would have no idea that people were being point blank rubber bulleted in the face all night long. Um, but they did and they were, uh, uh, so the kind of anarchist jurisdiction nonsense is a bunch of, um, fascist agitprop, uh, 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 designed to further militarize people. And then, you know, we have Nazis coming in from Utah yeah. and Washington because our, our, our gun laws are different and they can flex, uh, and they like, uh, uh, coming to, uh, um, I don't know places like this to flex and so we also have that that joyous that is a bigger uh n- gnarlier issue um with the cops working in concert with um boogaloos or proud boys and um uh, uh you know although they, they there was a there's a guy who uh, uh, doesn't even matter it's there are protests and um uh, the protests have become militarized, um, uh, uh, and, and, and exam and user and examples of, of, of exercising of the state exercising violence against the people, uh, uh, without, yeah. um, uh, oversight or really remit. They just do it. Um, but it has not stopped the, 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 it has not stopped and not silenced people, um, which is tremendous. And Portland has a long yeah. way to go to being an equitable or fair, uh, or, or even, um, honest, kind of place, but it, it feels like some of the hard work has started. Have you heard anything about the, the tear gas ban? Yeah. Allegedly? It doesn't, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that doesn't matter. They use it. They're, they're still using tear gas. That's amazing that the mayor can pass a law and the police are so lawless that it doesn't matter. 82% of the Portland police bureau or consists of people who do not live in Portland. 82%. That is familiar. Well, thank you guys for like bringing the reality of what it's like now to to listeners. We have folks all over the country, and I think it's really important to hear. And leads me to a question that is related to the comics that we are here today to discuss, which, you know, November is a noir story. It's a crime story. It's a story with characters who are both police and for, for, former police, police and people interacting with the police. What writing stories about police and crime as concepts, like, And this is not even just during COVID. This has been topics that people have been thinking about, you know, for a long time. Like, what is that like right now when you're making art around police and crime? Well, the cops weren't the good guys in our story. So it felt right. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't (laughs) that the cops were the bad guys. It was was about a specifically, you know, some kind of criminal conspiracy driven by bad cops. So... There, there wasn't a, I would imagine there could be a, a challenge of empathy, um, um, 
in the case of November, it's like, oh no, these guys are supposed to be the bad guys. We can write them as rapacious, as, as rapacious and violent uh, 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 as as they seem at times, uh, um, and and it doesn't require a um, terrific stretch of the imagination. Is there like themes around like the desire to depict and tell stories like that that feel stronger right now? No, not in particular. Uh, and also it's, it's a, it's, a, you know, I don't, I think they're very important stories to tell. I don't know that, 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 that comics are necessarily the, the, the best or most nuanced place to tell those stories. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly not in November, which was kind of, a, a lot you know a project that had been cooking for like two years before it saw print you know what i mean like like maybe if we started mm-hmm. something now it could it would be different but it just sort of like so much of the you know if you've, you've completed two-thirds of a of a cake recipe you can't turn it into a pie you know <laughs> um um but it kind of wasn't the story we were telling we really want to tell people about mm-hmm. a story about people surviving that mm-hmm. was really more important than than, than telling stories about uh, the, the the cops we want to tell people about surviving this this kind of nightmare evening well you definitely are in a good position in that you like as you said like you're not telling a story where you're like look at these cops they're heroes um so it didn't it doesn't have like that dissonance um and i know that a lot of folks are sort of questioning like the way they consume media around cops and police right now and i think like this 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 still holds up so i there's an amazing quote in we're not i'm not going to go into spoilers in, with respect to book three which is going to be on shelves no like october 21st uh but i I don't think it's a spoiler to say. Oh, right. Inshallah, (laughs) right? (laughs) Oh my God. I I don't, I don't think it's a spoiler to say there's an amazing line where a character says you can't call the cops on the cops. And that's just really resident, resonant, you know, reading it. Um, So you have, you have a story where that one of the main characters is a police dispatcher and former, you know, former beat cop. Um, What, what, what was the sort of, in, it's an interesting perspective to feature in the story and, and, and a cool place to sort of start it because as you're right, that is one of the places where, you know, a lot of people come into contact with frustration with policing. Um, uh, part of it was just simply from a, from a, a manipulative kind of Machiavellian writer standpoint, there was a character who stood in the, you know, um, it's kind of overlapping the other two characters. One that was lawless and one that was lawful. One is kind of jejun and naive and the other who is kind of cynical and um, dispirited. Right. And so, so knowing, just knowing how that character, the character K would end up being a kind of moral linchpin in the story and knew like, Oh, Elsa's going to, destroy this right like Elsa's going to just crush this so i i mm-hmm. i knew that i had a partner where i need a deeply flawed um deeply troubled person that we will believe can transcend all of that and oh, and and listen to the better, better angels angels of her nature uh and make the right decisions um in really bad times like that's kind of just as as a function of of what that character, who that character was, and what that character needed to do in the story to make the story work. Kind of that was I started with that, and then just knowing that Elsa was going to draw, it, I was like, oh, I, I can I can lean into this, and then sort of little specifics why and where it came from were all kind of plot demanded. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, I didn't. In fact, we're we're doing as part of Elsa's uh, Kickstarter. Elsa, I swear to God, I'm going to stop talking in a minute. Um, oh no, please go ahead. I'm doing I'm a. I'm happy listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a commentary for the second volume, uh, uh, in the way that Elsa sort of did a commentary for the first volume, and that's uh, uh, for her previous art book, and 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 it's really the first time I've kind of gone back and examined anything that I've written in this kind of this much detail, but you know, I was kind of connecting where the character came from in my, in my life. And I knew someone when I was a kid that wanted to be a cop and wasn't, uh, couldn't, didn't, um, pass the test, you know, couldn't get in. Um, Mm -hmm. and sort of the, and so they were like a security guard, but they were, this was like, you know, the kind of guy who would like wear a gun on his ankle to block parties, you know, and just Mm -hmm. even being, 
10, 11, however old I was, recognizing like, oh, there's something dumb and dangerous about this adult. <laughs> like this is a this is a this is a dangerous person. There was a there was a wannabe energy um of someone who wanted authority. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't like there's was no point that I feel like, oh, this is someone who wants to do good in the community. It was like a guy who wants to tell people what to do. Um and so that kind of maybe was the um genesis point uh, 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 uh of that kind of spirit and now how do you make that a character that that you can care about and you can believe in and you can want to see make the right choices who will make the right choices that's awesome that 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 she ended up being a cop or cop associated was a function of the story i think it's a it's a good narrative device when i was reading this i was like I'm surprised that this hasn't really been done before of <laughs> the dispatcher. It's, um, you know, it's a horrific job. There, there, you know, there are a lot of people who are traumatized by the experience. You know, you, you hear people in their literal moment of crisis day in and day out. Um, um, and so it kind of led us to somebody who was cop adjacent. And I think at some point she mm -hmm. maybe even in, it's either in three and four describes herself as being cop adjacent. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's sort of like, okay, that's, that's, you know, there's a liminal space between, you know, between, between D and M that K kind of falls in. So that was, that felt right. Cop adjacent was interesting to me. How did this team up between Elsa and Matt come to be? Cause I know Elsa, you were really eager to try a different kind of story with your art. Yeah. I, I, it felt, um, stuck for a little while because I, I had done a few things. Um, books targeted to younger and female audience and I was still started to feel this closing in on me and not being able to escape or at least being able to 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 do something else and uh, I really although I liked doing those books I didn't really see myself uh, doing those kind of stories for the rest of my career and so I decided mm -hmm. this is the next book that I that I work on is going to define whether I am going to be this artist for the rest of my life or I show people, readers, editors that I can do something else. And so I desperately wanted that. And um, and I had been a fan of Matt for, for, for a while now. And we had met in Paris a few years prior to that. And uh, they had invited us to stay at their home in Portland. And so when we were there, I just said, I'm just going to go ahead and ask him. And, and, and if it's no, and it might very well be a no, at least I know that I've tried. And he said yes. And so that's how it started. And the thing that was most exciting, and first off, I mean, I, 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 I can't... Elsa, I, I think I, I know you well enough that, this, that I know that this is going to embarrass you and I apologize in advance, but there's Elsa's story is so <laughs> amazing. You know, this kind mm -hmm. of uh, 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 her, her just limitless protean ability to do what she wants to do, right? Um, oh, I'm going to learn to draw comics now. And, you know, like when we met, she had been I think maybe two years, like from, from literally like the starting position to, to being already like just a wonderful uh, and gifted artist who was also one of those kinds of like talents that gets better with every page done. And when we kind of had that initial conversation about working together, it's like, I didn't really know what the story was. Or like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and we just, it was kind of, talking around the outside of it and the thing she said she wanted to do something that was really smart and like that was a challenge and that's the best that like like that's you know that's just the best um green light to, to like great that that is more interesting to me than any kind of genre or story right like let's let's start from that kind of place of let's challenge ourselves and do something that's that's requires a lot of um thought and consideration you know uh, um, um on our parts and and i don't know it was just like a really to see what if it, like she's better at the end of november than she was at the beginning of november and that's crazy because she's amazing at the beginning of november right hmm. like just just it's it's every every page every chapter every panel she's just 
exploding. And so the idea of, of partnering, collaborating with that kind of energy with the mission of like, push yourself, challenge yourself, do something that you've not done before, do something smarter was like, it, it, it was like a honey trap. It's impossible to say no to, you know? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring what you just said. <laughs> and I'm just, I wasn't yeah, of course, yeah, no, no, <laughs> But no, going back to what you were saying about genres and, and, you know, the start of the book that we wanted to do something that was different and that would maybe um, make, make, make people think, you know, put the book down and keep thinking about it. That's what I wanted. And so, like you said, Matt, I never, I never really told you what genre I wanted to work on because, first of all, whenever I'm asked this question, I'm like, I don't care. I really don't care. I, I care about characters. I care about, I care about story. Right, I really right. don't care about genre. Um, yeah. and, and the first time that you mentioned me the pitch, with the gun, the, the woman finds a gun in a puddle. And I was like, well, first of all, I can't draw guns. So there must, this might be an issue. And the, the concept as a story itself, you know, as a kind of thriller or noir, um, wasn't all that, you know, wasn't, um, and I, I don't want you to take this the wrong way at all because it's a compliment. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Elsa, the, it's, the, it's, 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 Elsa, it's drawn. You can, it's finished. You can say whatever you want about it. Now. I don't, I do not the, care. We're you finished. Know, <laughs> the, 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 the pitch of the story I found was interesting, but didn't passionate me, but I knew hmm. that you would be writing it and I knew that you would find a way to make those characters exceptional. And so I was like, I don't care. Do whatever story you want to, you want to tell right. I'm all in I think and I'm sure it's going to be great and I was right I love drawing this specific gun <laughs> and I love drawing those characters <laughs> and so um, I think that it's a great um, starting point when you start a col collaboration and it's not it's about two people knowing that they can do something great together more yeah. about whatever kind of genre or or right. you know audience we're going to sell this to yeah, your, your 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 energy changed entirely after you got the first script. You know yeah. what I mean? And that was like, uh, like, and uh, great. And then I knew, like, oh, good. Now you like it, you know? Yeah, um, because at first dude. I didn't know whether or not I was going to yeah. like it. I knew I would, but you know, I was waiting on yeah. reading the script, and then I read the script and was like, oh, this is incredible. I, you know, this is going it, to be it, a it, wonderful it, book. <laughs> it's it's hard to articulate, and I don't think I figured it out how to articulate it this way until like close to the finish line but like it's a crime and a noir story that takes place in the negative space around another crime and noir story that we're much more used to mm, yeah right exactly. this, it's the, the, the untold story of the our, our book is about the people in the yeah our, our like the people in the background of the crime movie that's mm -hmm. what this movie is about right like the, the people in the bank when the bank gets robbed not the bank robbers right this is we never even fully articulate what the crime is like what how what the nature of the conspiracy is how it works like we never fill in those blanks because those blanks aren't the story those blanks there's another you've seen that movie a million times you've read that book you've read mm -hmm. that comic we know the story about the, the the bad guys crossing each other we've fucking seen it a hundred thousand times this is about the collateral damage people that those stories leave in their wake um but that's not a very compelling pitch to anyone well, what if what if this is a what if this is a crime story about the people you don't care about? Uh, um, but then it entirely became about the people that you don't care about, and then you like you just start to care about them yeah, so you much. Do care like, about them. yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a weird <laughs> it's, it's it's a weird pitch to anyone. But I also think that right now, it's particularly we want to see the characters that aren't the ones that are centered on in the usual crime storytellings. And it's not a coincidence that all three of these characters are women and at least two of them are queer. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it was, it's a story about marginalized and invisible people like who is, you know, for like <laughs> I needed, I needed someone completely invisible, uh, a disabled Asian lesbian uh, seemed pretty fucking invisible uh, to the, popular culture to the popular consciousness especially especially one with a with a drinking problem you know uh mm -hmm. um, um so yeah it's about people that, that don't get attention paid to them in stories like this um where we are now going to pay them all of the attention 
I mean, there's definitely a tendency now for everybody to feel like the characters they create that have marginalized identities have to be like, quote unquote, good role models, which is Mm. incredibly stifling. Yeah. It's a new pressure for women as well. You know? Yeah. You have, you know, whenever, whenever you're a woman in the world now, you, you feel like you have to carry everyone with you in the responsibility of, of not crying, of not, you know... (laughs) That's an added pressure, definitely. Mm. Um, you mentioned, I, I do want to make sure that folks hear about the Kickstarter for the uh, art book. And I, I'm curious about, like, what is the role of making an, an art book? You know, how does it relate to November, the graphic novel series, uh, and etc.? Well, the, the art book in itself, I think I, I, I started wanting to do art books after we started November and and everything I learned about how we collaborated as a team and made it made me interested about uh, collaboration. And so the art book, this one is not I guess it doesn't really fit the definition of a usual art book. It's kind of part of it is, but part of it is kind of a potpourri of of everything that I deem interesting about uh, storytelling, you know, telling stories in pictures. And so uh, in a way it, it ties to November because it's what inspired it. And also I talk about how we worked on that book a lot in the art book. And, um, and, and for the first volume, which were kickstarted, was kickstarted last year, we decided, like Matt was saying earlier, uh, to do um, a commentary edition of the of the book. So it's kind of a commentary track, you know, we, we used to do on the mm-hmm. DVDs and Blu-rays. I think it's still, people still record those, uh, mm-hmm. where, you know, the director, actors, whatever, talk you through about their decisions in the movies and all that. And I always found this um, fascinating because you get to you know you get a peek behind the scenes and so the idea was to do that for november and so i printed out you know the the entire first volume and um handwritten on the pages my decisions you know my why did i you know leave out the background on this panel why you know why this character is standing here and not there and all all of those sort of what we do on a daily basis you know as as comic book artists and so for the second volume, the idea was to bring Matt in and to have his, you know, uh, creative process. So we're doing kind of a, a blend of our two uh, approaches for this new volume. And I'm very, very excited about it because uh, uh, Matt has a lot of very interesting things to say. <laughs> and Matt, you know, you were saying it feels real. You hadn't really like revisited your work before in an in-depth way as this and yeah. it sort of is like you're approaching your own writing as a critic in some ways but but you've done critical work before just not about you know your own work at least not in the public not in public yeah ah yes um I, you know uh, my the best thing i've written is the thing i just finished and the worst thing I've ever written is the thing that just came out. You know, it's just a constant, mm. <laughs> just never going to win kind of kind of place. Um, but the, just the act of, of of doing a commentary on a project like November requires a lot of table setting because ultimately you're talking about why you made decisions, right? Um, or well, either why, why you made decisions, how you executed, executed those decisions and things like that. And it just kind of requires a lot of, um, here's how I got to this place and here's where these choices came from. Um, um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of turning into as close to it, it. It's, it's, it's turning into like a textbook or something. Um, um, and it's much more kind of philosophical examination of my work practices and philosophies at the time that November was made um, and what I wanted to try and why I wanted to try these things um, um, without getting too into, without it being like, well, this means this and this means that. That's hmm. not what I'm interested in, um, but, but I want to talk about the technical choices and where these decisions came from what i wanted to do how working with elsa changed things and pushed me and made it better and and 
why we made these decisions and how it played into, you know, it's, it's a really formalist work. It's the most formalist thing I've ever written. And it's a big part of it. So you have to kind of explain a lot of, I don't even explain is the wrong word, but kind of explore these decisions and these choices. And, 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 and it's, it ends up being a lot of, um, table setting. I don't know how else to explain it. It's, it's been, it's been weird. I really haven't done something like this before where I've like, well, wait, where did that idea come from? Like I mm -hmm. once flew a kite so high, we couldn't see it anymore. All of my friends gave me all of their kite string and we kept tying them end to end. And it ate up every piece of kite string we could find. And then it got down to shoelaces and then everyone got called into dinner and we had to go. But like, I wow. could not that see that kite. Did it, that was this happened absolutely to you? me. The, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. 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 Like literally that we could not see the kite anymore. You could feel it, right? That the line was tense and the line was still moving and begging. None of us could see the kite. Um, so yeah, that, that absolutely happened to me. The, the dude who was a cop, right. That wanted to be a cop that had a gun on his ankle holster, holster at a block mm. party. Like that stayed with me when I was, from when I was a kid. Um, finding a number station on a radio dial when I, you know, by, by playing with the car radio in my dad's car and hearing a number station for the first time and realize, you know, and like that state. So that kind of that level of excavation, I kind of, I just don't do once the work is done because the work is done. I don't have to think about it anymore. So <laughs> it's been interesting as a process. What's a number channel? Number, number stations, stations are, right? um, kind of relics of the cold war and, and various different, um, uh, it's a cryptographic system where a shortwave radio broadcasts a stream of numbers or words at a certain time of day intended for a very limited audience, uh, to receive it. And, and it, it produces a, a, a piece of a two way cipher. Um, if you check out the Connet project, um, C O N E T project. It's an open source collection of recordings of radio of, of number stations from around the world. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's spy stuff. It's open air spy stuff. Right. Um, or it's not necessarily always so, um, sinister, but it is a kind of, um, you know, ghost whispers from a, from a secret world, um, that hypnotized and fascinated and creeped me out when I was a kid. Um, um, and that just always stayed with me. And then something like the Connet project comes out and I get to hear them again and kind of like hear all, oh, there's so many of them. There's from everywhere all over. And then I start to explore how they worked and what they were exactly. And we, oh, what was that? I was assumed it was like a, you know, um, what it was, you know, like a, like a, a test pattern, but for radio, you know, I, I always figured it was something like that or some kind of broadcast nonsense. It turned out, no, there's like a military and intelligence gathering apparatus that you're eavesdropping on somehow like mm. you know but again it's one of those things that i remember when you twisted the am dial all the way over to the right you could you could every now and again hear this stuff and i don't know things like that st stayed with me so no, it started with a number station in a lot of ways it started with the idea of a number station operator not getting their codes for the day wow i i, I would not have realized that and I guess my question about the kite is like, how did it feel? Do you remember how it felt bringing it back down again? From oh, that we didn't. Of we didn't like, like M, I had to let it go. Oh my God. Wow. That, that's awful. Huh. Lost a lot of shoelaces that day. Is this story, <laughs> a lot of, you know, lot, of, lot, of, lot of pissed off parents on my block. I never would have figured this story was, you know, lived. It feels so metaphorical in the book sure. and it, it sure. you know it doesn't feel real at all yeah it, <laughs> it, it's so over the top metaphorical it would be like a woman named hope giving the president coronavirus you know what i mean like it's so <laughs> it's so over it's so over the top that unless it, like, I would never have had the courage to write it if it hadn't had happened. Cause it's just huh. so like, Oh, come on, you know, <laughs> but no, I swear to God, I swear to God it happened. Wow. There's, um, there's a, a friend of the show, Armin, John Arminio, who I spoke with when I was, was like 
telling people, like, guess who I have coming on the show? Um, sent me a, in a question that I really liked, which was, uh, he wrote, uh, the line, fuck this city, fuck it in the eye to death forever, is a quote that will stay with me forever. Can you talk about how the city, in quotes, with capital T, capital C, uh, burdens these characters and how it creates systems of oppression to be their antagonists? I think living in a dense urban environment does things to you. Um, and some of us are ill-equipped for those environments. Um, I was born in Chicago. I moved around all over and had never lived in a city as large as Chicago again until I went back to Chicago as a college student. And I was not equipped for that kind of life. I wasn't equipped for, some of it was just the reality of being poor, uh, of uh, being a, a poor young alcoholic and drug addict with undiagnosed mental issues living in, in a, in a, in a big place. Some of it was you know, the reality of what late stage capitalism does to people below a certain income level. Right. Like some of it is just like, like the realities of just what city life is. Um, mm -hmm. it, I saw a guy kill himself one day. Um, he jumped. I was like literally the only day I ever rode in the front car of an, of an L train. Uh, oh, and a guy, no. um, jumped in front of the train and we ran him over and I heard it and I felt Jesus. it and I saw it. Uh, and it was awful, right? It was, it was horrifying. And the, the, the train doors open up and everyone kind of, kind of leaves and I'm, and I'm, I'm walking out and I'm, like about to the point of tears, like I'm just like in just shock. And I see a woman, sort of a middle-aged woman who also clearly saw it from the platform. And I think she and I are maybe the only two that witnessed it. Uh, and we start to kind of walk towards each other and we're going to hug. Right. But then the person who was with me kind of grabbed my shoulder and the person that was with her kind of grabbed, stopped us. And then we like, Oh, right. Right. We, we, that would be weird to hug a total stranger. We have to leave. Whew. And then everybody's bitching about how they're going to be late, right? Because the train's late. And now I got to get out at the wrong stop and I have to walk, you know, eight blocks and it's Chicago and it's cold. You know? And it was just like, what's the guy just, the guy just died. Did you guys like see that? Like a life just left, right? Is, you know, we, in front of us all, it just, we were part of the weight that broke him, you know? Uh, and now it's time to go home and, uh, where are we going to get another train? I guess we're going to walk up, you know, to, to Belmont and take the, to, to, to take the red line up and transfer it Northwest or something like it just became a, I didn't like what it was doing to me. I, I, and at some point became aware you could walk all day in any direction and you'd still be in Chicago. <laughs> and that was like, it's time for me to go. But again, that's as much me as anyone else. Like it's, it's, I'm not saying cities are the worst. I don't know. Like, no, no, it's, I've had amazing experiences in cities and have lived in large cities subsequent and it's been great. But at that particular moment, it became clear that sometimes there's a, there's a factory of, a, of, 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 there's, I don't know. It's easy to get ground up in a place like that, especially if you're alone, you know? Yeah. Community is important. And I think that's also one of the things that people have to recognize right now during coronavirus. Sure. The attempt of coup, et cetera, is like how much we need each other. Yeah. Fuck that's fuck 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 cities in the eye forever. I get it. Super get it. <laughs> um, you you also opened up the book with a poem by Thomas Hood, which was actually not a writer whose work I was familiar with prior and I hadn't seen the poem. It's like really bleak, but also just exciting almost. Like how how did how did you decide? And then, you know, then later you're like using Melville at the start. Like, how did you decide the poems that you wanted to use as a framework in the story? And, and what's the reason to start with poetry? Uh, it, 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 it felt <laughs> there's something literary about letting better writers set the tone. Um, volume four ends with Lou Reed. I'm very excited. I think it went from, from, from Hood through Melville to Lou Reed. So, uh, um, um, I don't know. You know, I was collecting stuff. I was collecting things about November, right? What do they call the full moon? Where does the name come from? I was just like literally have a page of my notebook where I'm just like gathering kind of things about November. Um, and in my kind of 
random researching of what 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 is this what's the symbolism of the month and what is the what does this mean and what does that mean and what you know what if it's 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 poetic histories and it's 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 liter you know i don't know just kind of wool gathering you know putting 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 ideas in the junkyard uh came across that poem and it like i had a i knew that it, the book felt like before i had written it i knew what i wanted it to feel like and that poem felt like how i wanted it to feel like so I thought maybe I could, uh, I could, uh, draft <laughs> behind it a little bit and, um, um, get my momentum going. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the question of the month of like, why November, like why that particular time and setting it, it, it felt so right. I almost didn't even think to ask you because it was just like, yeah, November, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's cause that's what it feels like. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate February more. Yeah, but. Feb Feb February is a different kind of suck. <laughs> That's an interesting point. February is a whole other kind of suck. Is part of the suck of November the fact that you know that, like, at least for me, the the reason I'm not full on like woo fall is because I know what's next. What's next is winter. Yeah, it's it's the I last month before the end. You know, mm -hmm. it 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 it's it's the you know <laughs> listen if you're not if you haven't left if you haven't like broken up with somebody before halloween you're stuck with them through easter right like like once once you're on the other side of halloween it is a straight shoot through the winter you you are stuck until spring wherever you are you're not getting out until april so like mm. it's that that like the, the days are longer or the, the nights are longer right the days are shorter uh uh yeah i don't know it's that that feeling of like oh death is starting <laughs> <laughs> i should i should put on a lou reed record <laughs> it's time <laughs> now it's a, lou, lou reed is not is not april is not april weather right i listened to um uh his first solo album though a fair amount in spring sure sure that that and transformer the kind of the the glam bowie Mm -hmm. But really, look after Transformer. It's Berlin. Berlin is November. Yeah, Berlin is November. Yeah. and that's the the quote from the 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 the, 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 the it's Good Night Ladies that we quote in Volume Four. Like it's it's from Berlin. Like, sure, the oh. glam ones. Sure, glam glam can be gla the glam ones. All right, but you know, I'm also you're, a New Yorker, real. so it's specific. <laughs> sure, sure. A New York phone conversation is is one of the best throwaway songs of all time. Right, like. But yeah, but out, outside of those first two, man, it's a, yeah, like on an, on, on inauguration day in 2016, I, I, I just played metal machine music all day. Hell yes. <laughs> and it just like made, made our poor office mate, like, uh, sorry, this is, this is what this feels like now. <laughs> this is what we're listening to today. Sorry, kid. That's a great call. Um, but you know what? It sort of brings some pieces together here, which is like, you're using poems and scene setting in November. Um, you know, you're obviously like a creator who has influences from music and other pieces of pop culture in your work. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fellow, like, you know, giant Rolling Stones fan. And like you, you name a chapter, some girls, and I'm like, is that a reference or just two words together? Right. Um, it, wasn't a deliberate reference, but it, it also can't not be, you know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, um, mm -hmm. I, I guess at some point a character has a line, uh, some, the, the, the line is some girls are just lucky. Um, um, I got shingles, uh, once upon a time, the shingles are really awful. Oof. And then, yeah. um, about, a uh, last a year ago, spring, I got him again. And the thing is, you're only supposed to get them once, right? And yeah. so I went to my doctor. I went to my doctor. I'm like, I think this is shingles. He's like, yeah, that, that's, that's shingles. Michael, I've already had those. <laughs> how, how is it that I have shingles twice? My doctor goes, some guys are just lucky. Um, um, Damn. So that that was kind of where it, it came from, was like the luck of, of getting a, getting a, a one-time disease twice. Um so yes, yeah, so that that it, it that that was kind of the root of the line was 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 that. But then just to reduce it to some girls, I was like, oh, that fits, and it also vaguely refers to a thing. So you know, um, I'm usually not one to shy away from references when I make them. You know, like mm -hmm. 
Like if I'm gonna, mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna refer to a Rolling Stone song, you'll you'll fucking know it. But at the same time, like it's it's it's, I think part of the reason those two world words sound so words sound so right together is because of the Stones. So, you know, involuntary reference. How about that? <laughs> One of the obsessions of mine and sort of the show is like the way that pieces of pop culture we consume can be the gateway that exposes us to other kinds of pieces of culture. So for example, like I said, I'd never heard of Thomas Hood. And then I read this, this poem and the story, you know, I, I know that comics are a gateway for a lot of different kinds of music for folks. Have you had conversations with fans where they've said to you, Oh, I read this because I read this in your comic or I learned about this through you. Oh yeah. 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 Um, and you know, and I, I'm very much a product of my generation and, and, you know, grew up with sample culture and meta text is text to me. It's just sort of where I came from. Right. I, I knew the opening guitar rift from the guitar rift from, from she's crafty is from she's crafty. Not when the Levy breaks <laughs> because I heard she's crafty first, you know? Um, mm. um, so like, that's just, that's just kind of where, but yeah, sure. That, that happens a lot. It's really you know, gratifying, um, and cool. And, and, and to think that like, oh, wow, I could have turned somebody onto this, you know, I, I bought my goddaughter a copy of, um, white light, white heat last week because of like conversations she was, we were having, um, um, you know, she'd gotten into television and we were talking about Tom Verlaine um. and, and Richard Hell and, and this sort of led to, trying to explain to her what sister Ray sounds like. I'm like, um, you know what? Here, <laughs> so here, take here. Here's here. You're, 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 you're 17. It's time. You're old enough. It's time for sister Ray. Oh my um, God. Uh, so that's great. This is awesome to be, to, to, to do, you know, and I know it's, it's, it's now that I have my own kids. Like if I ever try to put something in front of them, they will resist with all their might. Um, just because you're supposed to, right. No mm-hmm. one wants to look, l- listen or watch the shit your parents want you to watch. So, um, so yeah, that I can have that effect on people who aren't my kids. Like I'll take it. It's pretty cool. Uh, that's that's so true. Which actually is a weird thing though, because you know we're not baby boomers. Uh, I my parents were. I, I'm assuming your parents probably as well. And yet, like you know, obsessive about 60s and 70s popular culture. Yeah. Well, yeah what am I? How does that? Uh, I, I I remember. When John Lennon was killed, because it was the first time I had ever seen my parents sad. And at some point, my dad gave up trying to explain to me who he was. And he just put the the red and the blue records on for me. You know, he just put me in front of a record player and showed me how they work and gave me Beatles records. Um, um, it's kind of, you know, that kind of archaeology, pop archaeology or something has always been just a part of, I think, culturally who we are. Just, uh, uh, we, we're, we're, we inherited a lot from that generation, including that first real kind of disposable pop media, you know, whether it's TV or movies or music, it's, it's disposable pop confections are the coin of the boomer realm and they're our inheritance. And so we, it's our job to turn them into something more interesting. <laughs> well, Elsa and I were talking about Sunset Boulevard a, a bit when she was on the show before. Um, it's, it's, it's like, pretty what good. are some, you know, kind of right now? I, I was like, what are some of the noir inspirations for you um, for making this particular noir? Oh boy, I'm not sure. Is it fair to call like Brisson's pickpocket noir? You know, I guess Brisson. Um, oh. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't know that November is austere enough. I don't know that that actually worked, but, um, for Son, for sure, there's a, a, a Joseph Losey film called, um, the, oh God, was it the, the, the creeper, the peeper, the watcher, shit, the prowler, the prowler, that's it. The prowler. Oh, okay. It's very I much that, about, um, what do you do when you're, when you're, when the peeping Tom is a cop? Um, um, Shit. gosh, I, I'd have to, I'd have to think, I don't know. I, I yeah, it, it, it wasn't anything really specific with November. I think because November was so explicitly a noir, I didn't want to look at noir too much for it, for fear of just like adopting the accent, you know, that makes sense. But I like sunset Boulevard more than double indemnity, but is that, you know what I mean? Like, it's that kind oh. of, oh, so hmm. man, don't I'll make me on, choose I'll, shit. I'll die on that hill. 
I, I mean, seriously, that is a hard, that is a hard choice to have to, for me to decide between. Um, what, what are, from each of you, like, what are some pieces of popular culture that you've been watching, reading, listening to during this particularly fucked up moment in time? Elsa? I've been, uh, I realized that the other day uh, that I, basically what I've been doing the past few months is rereading stuff that gives me comfort. <laughs> I hadn't realized that was that's what I was doing, but I said, "Oh God, I just reread half a dozen books that I already own." So I guess my way of coping with all this is comfort <laughs> and going back to you know things I know uh, calm calm me down and uh, um, bring me to a place that I know I feel good in. Like I, I'm just I'm rereading Cersei. Um, from Madeline Miller, which I I, I, I I read. She hasn't written two books because it, she's a professor too, and she it takes her ten years to write a book. So she she only she only has two books out. But man, what books! They're probably incredible. And so I've been rereading her books, and I don't know. It's especially since Cer- Cersei is sheltered in an island. And she's kind of away from all the terrible people around her. Uh, I don't know. It, it comforts me <laughs> to picture me beside her on that deserted island, surrounded by nature and animals. Yeah. Uh, I've been um, going through the Rockford Files while I uh, run on a treadmill, and that's been really comforting for me. Is 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 running for miles um, and watching Rockford Files, <laughs> files and miles. That's my <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh man. Uh, you know, uh, when talking about any sort of crime comic, I'm, I'm thinking about like, you know, one of the huge things in culture right now that I am very much not a part of, uh, is like this, like real, real crime fiction, not fiction. I mean, it is in a sense, right. But like real crime podcast, real crime TV, is any of that something you guys care about or have any interest in? Uh, we watch a lot of that here. <laughs> My partner is into that a lot. I don't know. There's something about it that, you know, this, those terrible things happen to other people. I'm safe in my, you know, in my own life. And I'm like, I don't know. It, it kind of brings me the horror of the world, uh, like mm-hmm. real. Um, so it, it frightens me a lot, but it comforts him. So I don't know. I, I don't really understand that approach, but I understand also that it comes uh, some people down. I don't know. Uh, there seemed to be really something mm. to it. Yeah, my uh, my my wife is is quite the murderino, and I am not. Um, I don't I don't get it. I'm like you, Elsa. It just stresses me the fuck out. Um, um, uh, yeah, like you know, there was a a whole. They had a whole evening about yeah. a rapist that yeah. raped young girls, and it's like yeah. I don't mm-hmm. want to watch this yeah. before going to bed. Because I'm seeing, you know, myself as a potential victim for this guy, you know. I it's it's hard to find the, you know, the uh, the the entertainment part in it. Mm-hmm. I'm not judging. I'm just not seeing it myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think it's 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 absolutely some kind of um, uh, Thanatos at play. You know, I think it's 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 like watching mm-hmm. horror movies. I think it's a similar. Thing. Yeah, um, it's scaring yourself. Yeah, yeah. I bet it's yeah. It's not a. And I certainly had a a phase where that kind of. I mean, just especially too, like as a writer, like it's it's especially if you're a genre writer, right? There's all kinds of crazy stuff you can learn and pick up. But yeah, as I'm, I'm now like, yeah. no, no, no. I want to watch. I want to see Jim Rockford put someone like that away in 44 minutes. <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't want to listen to. You know how many defensive stab wounds were found on the palm of a child. I don't. I don't need that shit in my fucking head or in my life. Fuck, man. God oh, bless man. you if it gets you through it. But I'm telling you, <laughs> James Garner can have that shit sewn up in a tight 44 minutes. Glad to hear about it. I have not watched that show. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a look. You've made me curious. He's actually. It's a much more. Um, it's, it's, he's never. I, yeah, it's not those kinds of crimes on that show. It's a much more gentle kind of. Uh, yeah, it's, it's lots, of, lots, lots of fraud cases and stuff like that. Not a lot of, uh, not a lot of child rapists on on Rockford's radar. <laughs> Sounds good. Let's get into that white collar crime mother. That's like the real motherfuckers, right? So 
I actually, one of the things that I think unites um, your, your work with the uh, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen in November is that these are both comics where the characters who are usually at the periphery of the story are, are at the center of the story. Um, and I, 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 I'm a huge fan. I've had, you know, Steve Lieber has been on graphic policy radio. You to talk about Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, go give that a listen to folks. Um, and I, I, I really like Jimmy, Ol- Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, like the series that you guys are doing that you're doing with, with Steve, Matt is my favorite comic out of DC right now. It's absolutely one of the best comics on the stands. What, what are some of the things that make you interested in telling that story about the, the sidekick and about the peripheral figures? It's funny without, without that book, there wouldn't be November because when I first started to kind of put it together, I was putting it together for Elsa uh, with the idea being, well, let's, let's do this book. We'll have DC pay us to learn how to work together and we'll kind of introduce ourselves to the direct market as a, as a duo. And then after this, we'll go do uh we'll do a, our, 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 an original project. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, uh, DC was not into that. And so we, we, so, you know, I quit. And then like a year later came with a kind of entirely different approach to the book uh, for Steve. So there's kind of like, it's weird that, that, that like, like I'm working on Jimmy Olsen, like three years. <laughs> it's wow. So it's, yeah. It, 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 don't, it didn't, I don't think anybody could tell, but me, but like it was three years of work <laughs> and, and, and I, and I quit the book several times along the way. Um, but the, the first and most important because they were, they were not into doing it with Elsa and I didn't want to do it if it wasn't for her. So I had to kind of blow it up and reinvent it for Steve. Yeah, well, act, I'll just follow on this, which is, I mean, it's, it, it makes sense though, because the, this version of this Jimmy Olsen comic is like, very Steve, right? I, right. I, I'm, I'm curious, like, if you don't mind saying, what was the Elsa version of this story? Oh, all of it was, was it different. Noir? <laughs> no, no, no. It was, it was, it was more super. Um, it was, mm. it was, it was more. Pl- you know, th- th- there's something. I mean, kind of the fun of. It, it was brighter. It was. Um, more spectacle uh a little more spacey you know um a little more kind of um weird dc sci-fi than Mm. than the kind of faux uh, i don't know superhero noir or whatever i don't know superhero mystery or whatever i don't know it was just different it was different the tone was different the sound was different the shape was different it was all different i don't know how to articulate it it's also hard because it doesn't exist you know well yeah but I was really curious about that. I would, I'd love to see that someday too. Yeah. Um, um, but DC were too stupid to, to see the value in it. So we'll just have to satisfy everyone with November. It was the kind of like, literally it was like, well, fuck it. We'll, we'll let's do this instead. And I am glad for it. Yeah. Yeah. God, Christ me too. No regret at all. Yeah. Yeah. Their loss. Fuck it. If they're being kind of ultimately written at the same time. Mm. Um, and in fact, I finished November and Jimmy like the same week. Or a week apart, you know what I mean? <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. Um, um, there was it was everything I've written in quarantine was endings. Um, I wrote yeah, sex G- criminal. Jimmy eleven and twelve, the end of, no- of November four, and the the last sex criminals. All like everything I've, I've all the comic strips I've written have been endings. Um, and that was one thing that was kind of heavy. You know, that's a that was it. That was interesting. But it also then the, the reality of of quarantine and um, sort of summer of of police violence kind of changed in some ways some of the some of the grace notes some of the landings you know so, uh, part of the ways that some of those stories closed the the way that they closed um, yeah I think when I st- started november i don't think all of them well i don't want to spoil the ending i think the ending changed a little mm-hmm. um um and 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 jimmy the ending just kind of got ramped up more you know what i mean like, i literally wrote a pie fight um it felt like like i needed the end of blazing saddles because everything was <laughs> bad so i wrote the end of blazing saddles you know what i mean yeah, and we appreciate um, it. Thanks. Well, I, I was therapeutic for me. I hope it was therapeutic for you. 
Uh-huh. Oh God, yeah. I mean, what's what's fun also is like you know you were saying that like you and Elsa were trying to present to do a, a story together for you know a big for one of the big two because that's sort of how a writer and artist come together. They do this work for the big two, and then with that under the belt, they can then sell themselves as like this partnership, you know, and have additional interest when they're coming out and doing it on on image or what have you or create our own book but in this case you guys just went straight into image and you have this kickstarter component i mean definitely is a very different way of having your your team up sort of form yeah and listen if you can launch a a bizarre untested uh high dollar format for a complex four-part story part of which is being told in the middle of an alcoholic fugue. And you can launch that on the cusp of a global pandemic and a shutdown. Don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) Everything that could have gone wrong uh, with the launch of this book outside of our hands has gone wrong. It's been kind of amazing. To the point where it's like, well, at least the distributors, went, oh no, even Diamond shut down. Well, fuck me. Um, we didn't know when the second book, we didn't know where the second book was. We didn't know when it was coming out. Like I had to buy a copy from a local store. We just, it just one day was there. It was on a boat. It was in a, it was in a where, we had no idea where it even was. It was crazy. Um, but for the record, going back to what you were saying earlier, Ilana, about, you know, doing something at the big two and then establishing yourself and then going to straight to independent comics. I don't believe that anymore. Uh, I used to think that was the way to do things, but I'm absolutely sure yeah. that it's yeah. not you are, the case You are anymore. proof positive that it's not the case anymore. The whole world, as, as the world of comics has changed. Um, uh, 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 uh. The, yeah. Those past couple of years, it's, 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 there are, I don't think mainstream comics is as nope. important to uh, no. creators' careers as they used Absolutely to be. Absolutely right. I think you can totally, you can do totally fine on your own. The, the example I always give is, you know, Brian Bendis uh, and David Walker teach a comics class at Portland State University, and I will guest lecture. And the first time, you know, first time I lectured, maybe about ten years ago, you know, trying to figure out how to you know, engineer my, what I was going to talk about. I asked like, how many people here want to work for Marvel DC and how many people here know who Brian is and like everybody, but like one or two people raised their hands in the class. And the last time I was there and asked the same question, two people raised their hands. One guy was there cause he was a fan and wanted to like write Spider-Man and Batman. And the other guy was like, I, I, I just want to get paid to write. I'll write whatever. But literally the, the, the attitude in just a decade has gone from, I want to write Spider-Man. I want to write Batman to why, why would I want to make a, I want to make my own stuff. Why would I want to make somebody else's comic? That doesn't make sense. Like people don't want to write, people don't want to write Spider-Man. People want to be their own version of Reina, you know? Uh, and the, the, also the big difference is that you used to be able to dream about that, but now you can actually make a living and, and, and in some cases, yeah, better yeah, yeah. than you would working at, at yeah. Marvel. And, DC. and it's, it's, a, it's a, the, the, that, that sort of, oh, though, you just need a thousand true fans kind of thing. Like there's an economic engine in place that, that, and, and, a, and a, a communications network that makes that possible, allows that to happen. Um, where it's outside. And, and look, your, your Kickstarter is a perfect example of that, right? Like, like, why do you, when you have this kind of outreach directly to, your audience to people who not only love your work, but want to support it. Why would you ever need that's to go through main, with, that? That's yeah, why would you ever difference. need to yeah. pollute that <laughs> with the presence of people who feel that they know enough to tell you what to do? Um, communities and, you know, comic book communities and fans have, I think understood now that the creators that, they love need their support and direct support and maybe some time ago they figured that if they bought a few dc books and that was enough to keep their the artists that they love working for for dc or marvel or whatever and now i think they understand more and more that the direct support is what makes a huge difference and can allow creators to um you know um make their careers as they 
as they wish. You know, no, they have to go through the whole DC and Marvel, uh, hoping that someday you'll be able to tell your own stories. That that that's not it anymore. It doesn't happen yeah. that and way that's anymore. So good. It's so good for. And comics. that's thanks yes. to the audience that yeah. show and, up. And when you tell them, yeah, I need you now, they show up, and, and, and that's incredible. It is an audience that had been told for decades by the direct market, these these stories aren't for you. Mm, you know, yeah. um, um, instead of waiting for the direct market to expand and become more inclusive, there's a whole world that just, there's a whole other pie. Rather than cut more pieces, more, rather than slice more pieces, they've just made an entire new pie. Um, you know, and look, graphic novel sales are keeping bookstores open right now. The reason the New York times put the New York, put the graphic mm -hmm. novel bestseller list back in because they are such an economic reality for brick and mortar stores. It was disingenuous not to report on it. That's, and that's none a of those point. And yeah. none of those people are there to read fucking Batman. Raina Telgemeier mm -hmm. has kept the it, it, like like is a is a should there should be an award for her right the, the 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 money she has made the people she has kept in business the store she has kept open alone um is beyond is is is, is as titanic an event in the world of american or western comics as the creation of superman i'm glad that they brought it back for that reason as well as, you know, wh th whoever are the books at the bottom of the top of the list being able to get, you know, a little bit more attention off of off of being in there. But, you know, one of the things that I'm really thinking of with here is that you have this weird moment where comics as a medium are extremely important and people are really drawn to them right now. But it's not superhero stuff as much as it is things like you know, that are in different genres, you know, Raina Telgemeier, Saga, what have you. And then in the movie theaters superheroes are incredibly popular genre but it but superhero comics have not had like a similar like you know people are like oh i love iron man do you read anything no right like that's a very normal conversation to have with people and then conversely comics are moving away from the, having superheroes being sort of the be all end all of the genre i mean they've always not been the so they've always been out there but the, having people realize how big it it's is it's a broad yeah it's a broad like a it's a broad medium, you know, it's, and, and, and the direct market is made to sell one genre with a medium in one genre, yeah. largely, right? The, the direct market is, exists to sell superhero comics. It was diamond literally used sales of Batman as the metric for how every other book sold on their sales, on their, on their early sales chart, Batman equaled one and books would sell plus one or minus one Batman's like it's, it's des literally designed to sell Batman. Um, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it is a broad medium as comics around the world has shown, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, retailers have, you know, I've been talking more and more to retailers and because that's part of your job as an independent, independent creator, uh, and more and more they understand that they not only do they need, but they actually do want a lot of them to broaden their horizons and offer more variety to their customers so this change is also showing in in, in stores yeah, and, you know people our age in our kind of demographic and with our experiences are becoming retailers now right like it's it's the like so of course it's, there's a mm. generational shift happening behind the counter <laughs> as well and it's just as important as the one happening on stands yeah, you, you you had said something in an interview I heard, Matt, about like this is an opportunity to reboot the comics industry. Yeah. Uh don't think that happened, but um I'm also not particularly listen, it's 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 fine. Kind of the 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 you evolve or you die, you know. They'll they'll figure it out or they won't, but it's not gonna affect the comics aren't gonna go away. It's just gonna affect who sells them. Sure. Yeah, no, that's brutal, but it's real. And like, in some cases they brought this on themselves. I just mean like, Hey, there's a, there's a, there's an audience starving for stuff and you can get that stuff and you can shelve that stuff and you can educate your stuff about, educate yourself about what that is and you can sell it, or you can continue to sell to the same diminishing audience, the same diminishing returns, um, at the same extraordinarily inflated price. Um, um, 
it, 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 inflation of comic prices is insane uh, compared to where wages have gone. Like it, it just yeah. economically, the model makes no sense. You guys, it, you can't charge $5 for 20 pages. Um, um, and Hey, look, or you can go to target and buy graphic novels by people that you would never see on the racks of the androids dungeon. Who do you think's making more money? Hopefully not doing it at Target, hopefully doing it at a local store. But the reality is for a lot of people, that's not even an option. Yeah. Listen, if you 10 years ago said, hey, listen, in, in 10 years, you'll be able to go to Target and buy um, graphic novels directed at young adults and primarily like like a the decidedly female audience, you know, a decidedly mm-hmm. not superhero, not action adventure, but like like slice of life YA stories um, by women. Um, um, aimed at a young adult audience and it would be in Target and Costco, I would not have taken that. I, I would have bet against you with every dollar I had. <laughs> right? Because it sounds yeah. absurd on the face of it to where, where the thinking was at 10 years ago, maybe, but like, I'll say 20 years ago, right? Right, yeah. Um, um, but it's just, it's 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 a thing that I, you know, remember having arguments with retailers that this would never happen. I remember retailers screaming at me, women and kids don't read comics. <laughs> and then I would go to a bookstore on the weekend and see women and kids laid out like cordwood in the manga aisle buying yeah. $100 stacks of Tanku Bon. And it's like, no, they just don't want to read your comics, fat man. <laughs> For real. I um, But, you know, the other piece, though, and. I, you know, I, I, this is very self-selecting, but like, there's also a lot of us who are like, well, I don't want to re- reach, you know, why I slice the life stuff, but I also don't want to read Batman. I don't, I don't give yeah. a fuck about Batman. I want to read Jimmy Olsen. I want to read the, sure. the, the superhero adjacent stuff that's able to be more creative and more outlandish and more doing something that we haven't sure. seen already. And you have that freedom when you're doing the side characters, generally speaking. Yeah. I mean, I do think that Jimmy Olsen is a comic about comics, right? Like you were it's reflecting on- It's certainly a comic on... about DC comics. <laughs> yes, that's, you're right. It's that slice of it. But you're reflecting on Silver Age comics, especially, um, you know, both like the original, you know, Jack Kirby run with Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, which highly endorse folks. Seriously, please read it. As well as just like looking at the absurdities of, super, of Superman comics in the period as well. And then you're also grounding it in like a very fleshed out, in intellectually rigorous, it seems to me, notion of where Gotham City is, histo- not Gotham City, where, oh, there's some Gotham City too, but where, where where Metropolis is historically. Like, how does Metropolis as a city get to be where it is as a setting? And that combination is like, this was just like designed for me and my interests. Oh, cool. Great. Mission accomplished. Um, I said, listen, but you yeah, guys give me this book. Yeah. I'm going to sell you a guaranteed one copy a month for 12 months. And, and they were like, we're in. We're in that. <laughs> holy shit. You mean that's $36? We have to take it. <laughs> it's just, just for Ilana. But, um, like with the, but like when you're create, you're cre- you created this history, this fleshed, fleshed out this history of, yeah, uh, of Superman's like world. Yeah. yeah. And you brought in, fun. I had to check because I had, I'm not as big Superman reader. So I was, I was like, is Miss Techmach, Tess Machar like only from the movies? Or is she from comics as well? And you're like you're you're pulling from these different yeah she these she exists as, as, there has been that kind of Lex's right hand woman has existed sometimes she's a character called Mercy there's been she's existed like for some reason I just didn't want to call her Miss Tessmacher but like it's Miss mm-hmm. Tessmacher everyone it's Miss Tessmacher's Valerie Perrine fuck it she's in the book Love I don't it. care Rrr. listen also like <laughs> DC books are entirely about how elastic DC books are. And why, why not? Like if you can, you can, you can handle Batman with Joker's head in a lantern talking to you, but, but Miss Tessmacher is, is a line too far. Like we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're just, we're coming at this from two different places. Uh, do you, do you have a, I mean, it feels like you have a great affection for Silver Age comics when I'm reading this. Is that like, was there stuff that you revisited in, in creating this or is it just drawing from your own past? Oh yeah, no, sure. Um, the, 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 that whole silver age, Jimmy Olsen run sort of even before the Kirby stuff was, you know, the, the idea of the, the book is done in chapters because those books were done in chapters. That's kind of the only thing from the silver age I really wanted to take explicitly was that the, the mm. old Jimmy Olsen comics 
the stories were never more than like eight pages. So the, the idea of doing a book in chapters where we could just cut, cut, cut to another kind of chapter, that was, that was the thing I was most excited about. But there, there's something very elastic and, um, 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 there's a kind of Magritte level surrealism at play yeah. in, in a lot of those, lots of body horror, lots of psychoanalytic kind of dream symbols happening. Um, that's the stuff I wanted to mine. Not really the, um, I don't want to get like literal, you know, I didn't want to be too literal. I didn't want to be too continuity guy, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but listen, if you, if you get what missed, if, 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 if you get the missed, missed test, missed test mocker joke, then great. But if you don't, like, I don't think you're punished for not giggling. You know what I mean? I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a exclusive kind of continuity at play. It's, it's very if you get it, you get it. And if not, it's okay. And and you're not punished. You don't lose anything. Like all, there's like a scene where like the Jimmy Olsen fan club is evicted from their headquarters. Yeah. And like all the stuff that, that is being moved out is stuff from the early, from the Jimmy Olsen run of the sixties and seventies. And like, you don't need to know any of that. But if you know that in the first Jimmy Olsen, you know, Superman spell Jimmy Olsen, he was, a, he was selling ice cream from a bicycle great. Hey, look, there's that bicycle. Um, but none of it's like story important. It's just more for old, old, old men like me. And me, but I joke about how I'm an old man a lot. You know, the <laughs> thing that's, that's also consistent with the story though, is a, it's about land, right? Like yeah. them getting kicked out, the Jimmy Olsen fan club getting kicked out of their like rental space the yeah. the who is owning the land underneath and and also well, like your characters literally also say it and that's an extremely political thing to be writing about yeah weird huh I mean so it just kind of just gets right just slips right it's it's funny that that's the hardest part of the book to believe is the stuff that's <laughs> based on real world events um but yeah no like I I I. I like reread the power broker last year. So there's a lot of Robert Moses in my head when I was thinking about Lex Luthor, you know? Yeah. That's fabulous. It definitely feels great. Like, yeah. Like you, you wrote also your own like history. At least yeah. I think this is your history. I'm on yeah, yeah, yeah. Metropolis history. How did you, how did you develop that? I just did it. And they were I was like, this doesn't contradict anything. Does it? And look, not only does it not contradict anything, DC doesn't even know. <laughs> what their own continuity is right now like literally they're like i don't know them maybe it's, maybe it's continuity they don't know but no it just had, it was just a big blank that hadn't ever been done and and I, I i might be wrong but i don't know that anyone has explicitly drawn the line between lex luthor used to have br red curly hair and the olsen family always having red curly hair like it was just this kind of blank slate of how the city came about and so they just let me fill it in and hey, and if and it contradicts anything or you don't like it, it didn't really happen. It was just made up. Well, like, yeah, seriously, people shut up if that's your... <laughs> and, yeah, whatever. And, but, but I, yeah, it was fun. Know. It was just a big blank slate. So then the idea of like the Olsons being old money, you know, that there's there were stories about the Olson family that it existed. And that, that was a little mm -hmm. bit different. There's stories about the Luther family that existed that, 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 got, that, I, that I think I contradicted. But um, not in such a way that you couldn't squint and make it all come together, you know? And the spirit is there. I mean, this comic is hilarious. I think that is probably the most laughs per narrative caption of like pretty oh, much thanks. anything. Like, how do, how do you develop that sort of patter driven and definitely again referencing the original kind of captions, like sort of humor for for these chapters? And how do you know when you're actually being funny? Is that on the editor? I don't know. Um... I don't know. I, I, I think, I think trying, I'm not trying to be funny. You know what I mean? Like it's that, that Woody Allen thing about that's like the least funny thing. Like I think comic funny is not funny. Um, I think, I think if writing sex criminals taught me anything, it's that being funny in comics is really hard. Um, so, so kind of trying to not be funny, um, but play it for real, play it with some kind of grounding somewhere where like, yeah, it's a pie fight and there's absolutely a reason for it to be happening is, is sort of, you know, um, as it's on the, as, as absurd as that sounds. So, so trying not to be funny and also knowing too, that just like Steve could handle a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, and, and it was such an anodyne to working on November, right. Which was like very much going back to a city I wanted to be out of. Um, 
So the kind of the 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 more dire and bleak things got in November, the more satisfying it was to r- write about a character whose arms fall off every time he rides a roller coaster or whatever. Yeah, that was that. Uh, that really is a an interesting contrast in stories to be working on. But you also have like a rhythm in your captions. Like you have one of the issues that you have them saying, "What's this?" at each caption. "What's this? What's this?" Like you, you're yeah having a lot of fun with language. It, yeah, it's it's the old um, Batman TV show, right? It's that kind of William Dozier narration. "What's this? The the the, the, the Cape Crusader." That and like the old Super Friends narration, you know, it's that kind of DC narrative tone, which which exists in my head as much as, you know, Stan Lee's Hello, Drew Believers <laughs> stuff from the beginning of old, you know, Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends cartoons or whatever. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. And um, I, I'm always I mean, my conversation with Steve both times was all just like, how do we talk about making funny art? This is hard. Uh, mm. But you have such a great reputation of landing it, which is why November really felt super like have we, has he been there before this, this, it seemed like a, like a new, new ground. Yeah. The first time I, 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 gave, I gave Bendis a copy of it of November. And after he read it, he came to me and he goes, where did this come from? And then, and all I could say was like, uh, right. And Jim Nielsen, you know, like, it's mm-hmm. just the opposite. Like it's, you gotta have sour and sweet. You gotta have salty and sweet i guess you know i mean i'm just i need opposites I, I get bored easy and need different tones to to live in and work in and each each will influence the other well you heard it folks read them together yeah i mean i when i was revisiting them i was reading them both together last, last night and i was like oh this is fun to to contrast between one of the things with uh this is i would you know connecting this between jimmy olsen as well as november and for, for you as well Elsa, is like the sense of place that we see in in both of the comics and then we see a range of very different cities in there. Um, like where, where is November? I, I had the particular city come to mind for me. That was a bit of a projection. I'm like, is it Toronto? It feels like Toronto, but everybody has their own, their own inspiration on that. Um, the way I did it and it's not a specific city at all. I, I just drew what felt like a typical American metropolis you know big city Mm -hmm. it's not more specific than that it's just your typical because as foreigner i i've been to american cities a lot and there is something and you may see it differently but to me there's something that's very typical in american cities that i find all over Mm -hmm. the country even though you know there are some specific that changes um but i drew what felt to me like the typical american city so it's not either toronto or new york or it's just uh your typical american city through my eyes as Mm -hmm. a foreigner (laughs) yeah that's how a lot of people experience it so that's very much the idea of a city more than a specific place and there, there are parts of every city that feels like every other city, you know, and in, in America, for sure. It's, it's just the idea of a, a place you could walk all day in any direction and not leave. Those are the less compelling pieces of it. If you ask me when it comes to the, you know, when you, when I, when I'm in other cities, like the more it feels like this could be anywhere, the least, the less interested I am in where I am mm. in real life. That is, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's, there's something compelling about like, you can project whatever city you've had your own worst city experiences into, <laughs> into when you're looking at November. Yeah. As long as it, and, as long as the city that gets cold and wet, you're, you're, you're in the right place. It's not Houston, not Phoenix, <laughs> no. not Houston, not Las Vegas, not Orlando. Yeah. Other than that, <laughs> take your pick. Well, fans definitely uh, have a lot of arguments about Metropolis. Um, and I, like you, you have Metropolis, you have Gotham, you have like two seconds of Opal City with your, where, where are you drawing from? <laughs> and obviously, you know, Steve's work creates a lot of it, but I'm sure there's, you know, especially when you're talking about the history of Metropolis, like you're yeah. developing some place setting there. Yeah. So, so traditionally, um, Metropolis was Toronto and Gotham was New York. Um, 
Now, and I swear to God, I'm not making this up. The operating theory at DC for a while was, well, Earth in the DC universe is a physically larger planet than our Mm -hmm. Earth because the land masses are all bigger. Because not only do we have Toronto, New York, and Chicago on the North American continent, but we also have Metropolis and Gotham City. (laughs) and we all yeah we still have baltimore and opal like it is a there's an insane explanation for how that's all possible um i don't know if you there's a lego dc super villains game that my kids love and gotham and metropolis are literally divided by like a tunnel (laughs) and 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 it's rainy and dark and green uh a green lighting everywhere and the gotham side and then you drive through the tunnel and it's bright and sunny and beautiful on the metropolis side and it's hilarious and it's perfect um, um it's the difference between a good day in manhattan and a bad day in manhattan that's that's yeah. that, <laughs> that's that's uh, um, um metropolis is the best day you've ever had in a city and gotham is the worst day you've ever had in a city and i think that's a, a good way to think about it people like tend to get i think too specific yeah and that's look that's 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 superman and batman right it's apollo and dionysus it's it's light in the dark it's 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 the same it's two sides at the same it's it's you know two sides of the same coin well thank you guys for joining me on the show uh i it's been really exciting and there's like so much more we could talk about and i i strongly encourage listeners Go back, listen to my recent interview with Elsa. We got to talk a lot about how she came into becoming an artist, which is a really singular story um, and really talking about her her origins and her art and and the way she approaches drawing, the way she taught herself drawing. So um, go go check that out. And uh, and Elsa, uh, folks can find you on the internet where and find the Kickstarter where? They can find me on Twitter, mostly and instagram uh and the kickstarter is i guess on kickstarter <laughs> what, 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 mm-hmm. i have a link up on my twitter if you, if you go if you go to if you go to kickstarter and you search elsa oh nice it comes right up and uh what, sorry what's your twitter handle again um i couldn't tell you it's you type in my name and you'll find me i guess there i don't think there are that many people named like that me. is true <laughs> and matt uh i you are not a Twitter person at the present. I'm, I, uh, I, 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 I queeted. I, I'm a queeter. I, 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 I quit long ago. Yeah, um, which is legitimate. You are under no obligation to. Um, where's the best place for folks uh, to keep up with your work? Uh, comic book stores and bookstores everywhere. Um, and if you are a digital comics reader, uh, Comixology um, um, tends to have most of... Uh, of, of my stuff. Um, a lot of, and I believe most, if not all of my Marvel work is, is available both there and on the Marvel, um, digital comics reader is a DC digital comics reader as well, but that also all goes through comicsology. So find me wherever then, fine yeah. books or even mediocre books are sold. I'll be <laughs> right there. And when is volume three? Uh, well, when do you approximately, maybe do you think volume three of November will be on the shelves? November volume three will be in comic book stores, we believe, on uh, Wednesday the 21st and in bookstores, hopefully by the 23rd of October. So it's November and October, starting the week of the 21st. Um, and then volume four will be uh, uh, January, a talk question mark, we think, unless, say, the entire world shuts down again. Got it. So. And Elsa, you're almost at your Kickstarter goal. How many, you have 18, 18 days left <laughs> to go at this point? <laughs> oh, shit. I, I read that wrong. You slant, you completely creamed it. We did. In the first six minutes. Um, yeah, we way past the original goals. I think I asked for like nine, ten grand and we're almost at yeah, the Elsa, as of this exact $1, moment, $1, you are at $98,978. Holy fuck fucking shit for an art book isn't that it's amazing it's great and it speaks to first off how good you are how many people enjoy your work and and how useless an appendage the direct market is sometimes Mm -hmm. it's fantastic this is great (laughs) it's the best yeah, so it's still up uh for another two weeks tell them tell them about con at home tell them about con at home 
Oh, yeah, please. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of our stretch goals, which is going to be the next one, and I think we have like $5,000 to reach it. Um, I'm going to be doing a convention at home and I'm going to stream it for backers. It's going to be an exclusive event for people who have pledged on the on the Kickstarter campaign. So basically like a convention, regular convention, I'm going to be doing free sketches, Q and A's, live streamings and all that. And all that's fun stuff and it's for backers and it's going to be really, really fun. That's awesome. And everything's free. It's all gonna be free. If you've pledged once, you don't need to 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 get your wallet out to have fun stuff. It's that's a really free. great idea for an event. I, I hope that folks will follow follow in that in that concept because we it's miss such each a great other idea. i hope so too it's such a great uh, also you're so good at kickstarter it drives me crazy it's great mm. uh, thank you. i mean it'll be an opportunity i mean for fans also to connect with each other and to talk about talk about art right yeah oh yeah absolutely we're gonna try and make this as interactive as we can uh, maybe doing some you know splitting screens and have some people up live with me so we're still figuring things out because it's a lot of logistics uh, but it's it as much as possible we're going to try and not replace because you can never replace a yeah. comic book convention experience but at least you know have that um experience of sharing some fun times and talk about the things that we no, have we, we attendees. We will have to provide our own greasy, overpriced pizza ourselves. Hmm. Correct? Okay. Yes, I you will are, not. Pizza not I will included. Not provide this. What about a four dollar <laughs> yeah. cup of ice with seven <laughs> ounces of Diet Coke? How how do we get those? <laughs> you have to okay. bring your own. You as well. should, as a stretch Sorry. goal, for like a hundred and fifty, you should make lanyards. You know, like the the badges, <gasps> yeah. the things that the, like you should print print con at home lanyards <laughs> and send those to backers. Um, actually, I'm gonna I'm not going to say more. But am I close? <laughs> actually, <laughs> oh, fantastic! <laughs> You're not too far. <laughs> That's amazing. Folks eat that stuff up. That's very creative. And listen, I know it's extra dangerous right now, but if Elsa makes two hundred thousand. The stretch goal is I'm going to cough into an envelope and we'll send it to all the backers and maybe you'll get con crud that way. Woohoo. Thank you. <laughs> Full yeah, experience. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, I never actually got no? con crud ever. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very either. proud. Yeah. Well, I, I have never gotten like truly sick, but I've definitely gotten like a little, you know, like a cold or whatever. Sure. Yeah. I've never. Well, no, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm also, I'm like you very fortunately have never, it never hit me. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. It's really, truly been a pleasure. Um, I, I would love to have you guys both back again, of course. And for our listeners, we are graphic policy radio. We are on basically every podcast platform. If you want to contact me, I am on Twitter a little bit too much. In my defense, it is literally part of my job. Um, I'm at E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. That's E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. I am also happy to continue my ongoing volunteering and activism dating service in which if you tell me what kind of opportunity you're looking for or a way you're trying to help us, like, literally prevent the Trump coup, I will be glad to connect you with people doing campaigns online or offline, phone banking, text banking, and other volunteer opportunities that can help us actually contribute to the future in which we live in and exist. Because we are not just passive uh, players in what is going on around us. And we, we really have to rely on each other to make it through. So um, with that advice in mind, as we say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.